the distortion of sin that separates you completely from what I want to do, and then the distortions of life to bring you back to myself over and over again because the renovation process is a lifelong kind of renewal work of Jesus because life takes its toll on us, distorts our relationship with our God. Elijah has a distorted view, but he also has an experience of the eternal. He might have been looking for one mighty act of God to blow through all of his doubts or God just to take over. Maybe that was a little disconcerting for him. But the immediate impact of God's presence makes it clear and, and his involvement in Elijah's life over and over makes it clear that Elijah is not on his own. God has not abandoned him and left him to figure out life on his own. God has been present. We can look back over his story and see it. And he continues his presence in, in him. And again, the conversation comes from the Lord. In this whisper, a voice says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And again, in exactly the same words, <laughs> Elijah replies, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. It's, it's almost as if he has memorized his response, see, <laughs> seemingly. It's the exact same conversation. It's the same question. It's the same response. But something different happens now. Somehow, Elijah's attention is drawn. His awareness is renewed. Elijah's not on his own. God's there with him on the mountain. Hasn't lost track of Elijah. He's not surprised Elijah has fled in fear. His expectations, you know, God's expectations of his prophet haven't been disappointed because he knew. And running, Elijah has not run away from God. We do not run away from him. Uh, that 139th Psalm, right, talks about how God knows us and he made us and all those things. And in the middle of that Psalm, it says, it asks this question. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go down, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. See, it's not about your grip on God. It's God's grip on you that's at the core of your own personal renovation process. Elijah's not his own, and Elijah's given a new direction. That's what changes now. That's what the encounter with God's presence changes. All of a sudden, now Elijah's open. God knows he's ready. He senses what he needs, and it comes to him. The Lord says to him, Go back. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Time for just a little bit of a geography refresher for the region we're dealing with. Okay, here's a map of uh, Israel in those days. And you can see clear down at the bottom, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. That's where he's at. He's almost as far away as you can go, straight below where he was before. And his challenge is to head clear up north to Damascus, an area at this time under the control of, of Israel, but still having some independence and its own, own kind of leadership in the region. To do that, he's told to go back the way he came, right? Not to escape out clear to the uh, you know, the desert outside, but to go back through to Beersheba, to head north through <coughs> Judah, to go through the length of Israel, 
to do that, he has to head back to the area where, well, he had just fled. Right? He's got to face his enemies. He has to face his fears. And God promises and gives him a destination that holds the promise of his enabling, that he can make it, that he can take this trip. He can make it to Damascus because that's where God is telling him to go. His new directions come with the promise of God's help. Hmm. Really, the better we're aware of God, the more we're open to his influence, to his correction, to his direction. Those things come as a result of a personal connection that God has with his children. You need to be able to hear from God yourself to say, I know what that next step is for me. I know what it looks like. I understand that's God's invitation and his expectation for me. Elijah, he's given that new direction. And he's assured that he doesn't, not only isn't he on his own, but he doesn't serve alone. He said, when you get there, when you get to Damascus, right, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphath, from Abel Minholath, to succeed you as prophet. And Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. We're not going to talk much about the sword of these guys, right? That's their job. Elijah's job is to kind of pass the torch along because he doesn't bear the burden for God's future work alone. Others, others share in the leadership work. Elijah doesn't do it all, and guess what? None of us do it all. Your responsibilities are your responsibilities, but you don't carry them alone. God never intended you to bear your burdens alone. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason he can say that is because he bears those burdens with us. But it's also why he brings us together for you and I to care for one another, to recognize our different ways in which we come alongside each other. It's the purpose for the church to exist, at least one of those purposes, to share in the tasks that God has called us together for. We are not alone. Others among us share responsibilities for God's work together. There's another little verse that comes at the end of this. It says, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. It's simply, there are other worshipers, right? Worshiping God, God's place, his activity in the hearts and lives of others continues. God opens up to him the reality of the nation. Yes, it's a very difficult time to be a servant of God, to be one of his followers. But there are other faithful ones, and God knows them too. Our, our perspective can be so hindered by our pain. Our, our future can be closed by our fears about life, about what we know, what we, what we think might happen, that we become, well, uh, distorted in different ways. Today I invite you to just to some kind of distortion clearance work as we come around Christ's provision for us. A God who knew your sin and sent his son to pay the price for it. A God who said, whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast them out. A God whose invitation is to whosoever will may come. Allow Allow that, God, to see where you're really at. 
to receive by faith his, his work of a God that's for you, that wants to give you that next step and set the direction for your life. And to know that you don't have to do it alone. He, he'll help. He has others along that want to care too. So Heavenly Father, you who see our hearts Lord, just ask for you to expose again where we are in your sight. To expose our distortions today, Father. And Lord, if, if we've never come, there'd be those here today that have never come and finally and in that very initial way been willing to turn their lives over to your hand, to your control. Never placed their future in your hands. Never came and took all their past and asked for your forgiveness and for your restoring work and invited you to take that place in their hearts and lives. Or maybe now. Now that voice of yours is clearly speaking to them and saying, today is the day you become mine. For others of us, Lord, you know where we're at. And it might be that we have come so far and now found that our feet are wavering, that our hope is dim, and our ear is not very finely tuned to your voice. <laughs> Lord, bring us back into this act today to that place of surrender and trust where we receive from you what is needed, where we acknowledge where we're at and you meet us there. Lord, we want to honor you in this celebration today. In your name I pray. Amen. In our communion celebration, let me tell you that this is the Lord's Supper. It's not our church's supper. You don't have to have gone through a particular program or a, a, a meeting or qualified in any way through, through me or through our church. But Scripture is pretty clear that we ought to examine ourselves before we partake. First, we need to really be honest. Are we one of his? And secondly, are things okay between us? <laughs> As you examine yourselves today, and you come up with a particular set of struggles in those things, you could do one of two things. One, as the cups are passed and you realize you, you're not okay in those two areas, you can just pass on celebrating. It's... There's times in which maybe you just aren't willing to, to testify to that reality. That those things, even though you're right on one hand, but the other hand just isn't quite there today. Better yet is to take the moment. I mean, what are you waiting for? Are things going to get better? What's the, is there another process? Instead of just saying in this moment to the Lord, Yes. Just saying yes. It's a simple thing for me to suggest. Sometimes it takes in a sacrifice, more sacrifice than the moment and more genuine work to come to that place. But it's what we celebrate. It's what we invite you to testify to this morning. We just simply... Read the familiar verses again. Paul writes about what he received from the Lord on the night that the Lord was betrayed. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember his work on our behalf. We trust his sacrifice to be enough to provide proof that we can trust him with the reality of our circumstances. So let me invite the elders to come forward. We're going to begin by passing out uh, the bread, remembering his, his body, and then we'll pass out the cup. As it's being distributed, we're going to ask you for, to wait until all have been served. We'll have a prayer of thanksgiving and then for take together. Well, Heavenly Father, we hold in our hands a reminder of how broken we, we are and how you willingly entered into that brokenness and took for us the, the pain on your own body, the punishment that would have been ours. And so we remember, we remember you and your sacrifice in this. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's partake together.
Well, Father, again, we're reminded of how much we needed your care for us and how in such an amazing act of love you have given what is needed for our past to be forgiven, for our present to be enriched, and for our future to be secure through your work and through the sacrifice of your Son. So we do remember our Lord's death and look forward to that day when we see his face and when his kingdom finally comes. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's partake together. Let me invite you to take your hymnals, and uh, we're going to close with singing number 206, Wonderful, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. I want to remember that uh, at the end of our communion services, we receive a gift for our deacons' funds. These are gifts that we use to help people that call from the church or people that you know that need help. Sometimes people within our church family with a pressing financial need and that we set these funds, funds aside and, and help people with them. So we appreciate your gifts to our deacons fund. They're in the middle with a, a, an offering basket as we're dismissed this morning. To find it, it's number 206. Why don't you stand? <laughs>